If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Daniel chapter 12, we come now to the final chapter of this great book. Now the word great could be speaking about something that's, that's just very wonderful or something that's very long. In the case of the book of Daniel, we're not talking about something that's very long, but something that is very wonderful. Uh, chapter 10, 11, and 12, we found, were the final conclusion. Uh, until you get to chapter 10, every chapter of the book of Daniel, the, all nine chapters, are one event after another, separated by chapter divisions. But when you get to chapter 10, 11, and 12, you'll find that it's all one event, one final prophecy. Uh, but within this final vision, you have, we saw at first the great vision. Daniel was first, he, he saw the Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate glory. You could compare what he saw in Daniel chapter 10 to, to Revelation chapter 1. We saw what we entitled, well, Daniel actually calls it here in chapter 10, the great vision. Then the, the veil was pulled back from uh, in front of his eyes, as it were, and he saw the great war. He saw angels coming to him and speaking to him about a battle that they had been fighting with demons. And the fact that there are battles between angels and demons was, was revealed to Daniel here, the great war. Then in chapter 11, we saw the great prophecy, 135 specific prophecies about the Greek empire that would be fulfilled two and three hundred years later. We even have the proof to this very day that the book of Daniel was written two and three hundred years before these prophecies were fulfilled. And we know without any doubt whatsoever that they were fulfilled perfectly, exactly the way that God predicted them. We saw then the great vision, the great war, and the great prophecy in the beginning of chapter 11. And the end of chapter 11 takes that prophecy and then continues to show an end times prophecy about what we call today the Antichrist, this man who's going to uh, arise and lead a world empire. And so we saw the great vision, the great war, the great prophecy, the great Antichrist, and now we come to chapter 12 where we will see the great tribulation. The great tribulation. Now, there's a couple things I think we need to lay as groundwork before we jump into this chapter, before we begin reading in, in verse number one. The first is that we must ask ourselves, why? Because as, as we've said before, there's, you, there's two different thoughts usually when, when it's announced that the, the preacher will be preaching from, from a prophetic passage, end times prophecy. You have some people who are um, prophecy nerds, which, by the way, I fall into that category. <laughs> but sometimes that can go too far. And it's, you know, that's all I care about in the Bible. I just want to study the end times prophecy stuff, and I don't really care about anything else. That's the only thing that makes me excited about the scriptures. That's too far with that, right? But then there are the people on the other side who go too far in the other direction. And they're the ones who roll their eyes and say, oh, no, not end times prophecy again. You're you're sounding like one of those guys on the street corner with a cardboard sign that says the end is near. Come on, let's, let's be uh, reasonable about this. But we must understand from this passage that this is important. Otherwise, we cannot explain why Jesus Christ himself in his pre-incarnate glory showed up before Daniel received this prophecy. Understand that the other 135 prophecies in chapter 11 that speak of the Greek Empire were not so that Daniel would know what would happen in the Greek Empire. That was not important. It was not important for him to know those things, except to know that God knew that they were going to happen before they happened, so that this could be proven, this whole prophecy could be proven, on the basis of this massive amount of evidence, God then proceeds to give Daniel this prophecy about the end times. So whatever conclusion we come to about this, we must say, first, that it is true, and second, that God wants us to know it. And if it is true, and if God wants us to know it, and he wants us to know that it's true, then we have the responsibility as God's people to study it. There is no question that it pleases God for us to know the things that he gives us here. And so, if it pleases God, we're going to do it. That's what we do. Now, I think we'll find great application 
even to our time, even though we're not in these, these end times at the moment, I think we'll find great application. I think Christians for the last 2,000 years can find great application, even though they haven't been in the specific time that's being prophesied about here. But that's not the point. We're not here to find application. I think we will find some, but that's not the reason we're here. We're here because God has made it abundantly clear that this is important to him. And if it's important to him, it ought to be important to us. And so, because it's important to him, we're going to study it. Now, what do we know so far about this time period? Well, remember in chapter 7, we were given the first, the first bit of information. We're told that right before Christ returns in his kingdom, right before the, the, the Messiah returns to set up the kingdom of God on the earth, that there will be a three and a half year period of time in which a king will rise to power over a world empire and will make war against God's people for three and a half years. Then in chapter 9, we're told that, uh, in, that there's a seven-year period, and in the middle of a seven-year period, this king will commit an abomination in the temple that will be similar to other abominations that have happened. He'll make it desolate. He'll desecrate the temple, and that he will then proceed, we, we could then assume halfway through a seven-year period, means the last half of those seven years, the Three and a half years is a time where, uh, where the people of God are warred against. They are, there is a war against them. There is a persecution. There is a great tribulation that comes on the people of God. When we talk about the great tribulation, what we usually think about is meteors falling from the sky and earthquakes and all of those things. Those are all things that we know come in that period of time as well, but that's not the tribulation that's spoken of with the phrase, the great tribulation. The Great Tribulation is talking about the persecution, the war that this Antichrist enacts against God's people. That is what's referred to when we use the phrase, the Great Tribulation. So when we talk about the Great Tribulation, we're really talking about three and a half years before Christ returns, the promised Holocaust against the Jewish people and anyone who will stand for God and refuse to worship the Antichrist who claims that everyone should worship him. Now, with this simple foundation in mind. These are, these are the things that we found in the book of Daniel. We're not adding to that yet. We're going to see how this is played out and, and drawn upon in other po- prophecies. By the way, Daniel is a foundational prophecy. Every other prophecy in the scriptures that deals with this time period is going to refer back to Daniel and try to explain, uh, and not try to, but successfully explain Uh, the book of Daniel to us. So we're going to see some of that. But let's look at what Daniel says in verse number one. And at that time, it says, just pause for a second, at what time? Remember in the end of chapter 11, we heard about this king who's going to claim to be God. He's going to magnify himself above all gods. He's going to amass a massive army. He's going to honor the God of forces and, and weapons. And then he's going to then he's going to claim that he controls the world and there's going to be some world powers that, that rise up against him and he's going to go out and, and war against them and put them down. And, and uh, at that time, in that period of time, it says, shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Now who is Michael the great prince? We heard about him in chapter 10, didn't we? He is the archangel. We saw it in chapter 10. He was the one who rescued the angel who is speaking. Well, actually, one of the angels who's speaking. There's apparently several angels, we'll speak about it in just a moment, that have come to give this prophecy to Daniel. Remember, one of them comes and begins to speak to Daniel and says, Listen, I started coming when you started praying at the beginning of chapter 10, three weeks ago. And on my way there, I was held up by a demon that he refers to as the prince of Persia, some demonic ruler over the, uh, over the demon forces in the nation of Persia, captured this, this angel, but apparently captured his other, his other uh, co- company with him. It was a whole yeah, commando unit of angels, apparently, because uh, Daniel's still very faint at the moment, and, and this angel uh, stops talking to him, and another angel comes to him, according to chapter 10, and this angel looks more like a human. And then another one comes and speaks to him and looks like a human. We won't go into that because we're going to come back and read that in just a moment. 
But at any rate, now this third angel is telling him about it. But remember what the first angel told him, that when he was captured in the kingdom of Persia, that it was Michael the prince, the prince of the angels, who came and rescued him from that captivity. And now he's here. Now he's saying, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. He says, listen, this is what... What the angel Michael, his whole job is to lead the angelic forces in defense of God's people. Like that's his work. We all have our own job. We all have different places to work. Apparently these angels do in the, in the war that God is uh, allowing to take place between angels and demons at this very moment. Michael's job is apparently to stand up for the people of Israel. Now look at what it says. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Well, I guess Michael must fail. If he's standing for the people, why is there a time of trouble like there never was since there was a nation? Well, I think we'll find the answer in a moment, so just bear with me. I think that's a fair question to ask, though. All right? There shall be a time of trouble such such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And in, it's, let's just read verse 2, and we'll summarize what we've read. Verse 2 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and content. Now, let's summarize four things that we see in this, four pieces of information that were given. First, that during this time, this time of trouble, the time of tribulation, there will be a war between Michael, the archangel, and demon forces in a, in a, in a spectacular way, more than the great war that's co- constantly going on all the time. He's going to stand up in a special way and fight in a different way against the, the demon forces that are attempting to harm God's people. So we have that. Number two, during that time, there will be trouble on God's people such as never was since the nation of Israel existed. And it may even, the wording here may even mean since there was ever a nation ever in the entire world. Um, But it it appears to be referring to the nation of Israel, um, which tells us a few things. This is not something that's already happened. This has to be something that never has happened before and never could happen again. It's so great, the trouble. Now, we've seen Israel go through times of trouble, right? I mean, look, um, their, their, the nation was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, the city was destroyed, and they were all carried away into captivity in Babylon. But that happened before Daniel wrote this, and this was supposed to be something that had never happened before. When they came back, Antiochus Epiphanes comes in and he desecrates the temple, but he doesn't destroy the temple. He doesn't root the people out of the land. He does persecute them. But the people stay in the land. Then you have um, the Romans in 70 AD, after the time of Christ. They come and they destroy the temple and they destroy the city of Jerusalem and they uh, destroy the people and they all scatter. But that's the same thing that happened back at the time of the Babylonians. There was nothing new. This is going to be something greater than all of those things. There's been holocausts before. Uh, By the way, Hitler wasn't the first one to enact a holocaust. There have been many who've tried to stamp out the Jewish people, and they've all been unsuccessful, but this is going to be worse than them all, according to the scripture. Michael will be fighting in the great war. There will be a time of trouble like never before. Number three, they will be helped. It says, even to the same time, and at that time, the people shall be delivered. So they will be helped. They will not all be destroyed. And number three, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. By the way, Jesus quoted this in his ministry, saying that there is a resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto damnation. Christ quoted chapter 12 of Daniel many times. We'll see a few of those examples in a moment. So we have four things. We have a, a, a war going on in the heavenlies between Michael and the devil, Michael the archangel and, and, the, and uh, the demons. Then we have a time of trouble like never before. Then we have them, the people of Israel and God's people as a whole being helped 
through this time. And finally, we have a resurrection. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and contempt. Now, this may seem like very primitive facts. What, what do we do with these facts? Well, I think, I think they are intended to be just the baseline things you need to know. These are basic foundational truths. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Revelation, and we'll see how this prophecy is so crucial to everything else in the Bible. I mean, this is the foundational prophecy uh, on which is built all the other prophecy about this time. Revelation chapter 12, if you will. Remember our four things that we found in Daniel 12 about the great tribulation. Number one, there will be a war between Michael and demons. There will be a great trouble such as never was before. Number three, that the people will be helped during that time of trouble in, in a supernatural way and uh, they will be delivered. And number three, that it will all end with resurrection. Now, look with me if you would at Revelation chapter 12. Here's what it says. Verse number one. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon upon her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now in the book of Daniel chapter 7 and in chapter 8, especially actually in chapter 8, the people of Israel, the Jewish nation, are referred to as stars, the hosts of heaven. Um, so here we see a woman who has 12 stars on her head and we can very easily uh, guess that this is a picture of Israel. Twelve stars, the twelve, nation, twelve uh, tribes of Israel. Verse 2. She being with child cried, travailing in pain, uh, in birth, in pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven horns and ten, uh, having, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So, here we have, she brings forth a child, and the child is the Messiah. That is clear, that we're talking about Israel. Israel brings forth the Messiah, and, the, and there's a dragon that's trying to devour and kill the Messiah. Verse 6, I think it's clear who the dragon is, but we're going to see it in just a moment. So I'll let the Bible tell us what it means. Verse 6 says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. Anyone want to guess on how many years a thousand two hundred and three score days is? Well, it's, it's three and a half years. What we're talking about here is you have in the first five verses and in, uh, the, the baseline of this, of this vision. So you understand what everyone is. You understand that the woman is Israel, that you understand that the dragon is the devil, that you understand that her child was the Messiah. And then, you say, and then it jumps to the end times prophecy that's covered in Daniel. Now understand what it says about this time period. Verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. Well, that's exactly what Daniel chapter 12 tells us. That at that time, Michael will stand up for thy people. But watch this, verse 8. Um, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now let me try to make this, um, make this uh, just very simple and basic and easy to grasp here without getting into the weeds. What we know, if you've ever read the book of Job, you know that Satan has access to heaven. He likes to go to heaven. He does it. Now, apparently, according to what we just read in Revelation chapter 12, and he regularly, he regularly shows up in heaven day and night to accuse God's people before God's throne. I mean, he comes up and he says, hey, did you see what uh, Pastor Josh did? He's supposed to be a pastor. And you see what he did the other day? 
Can you believe that? You call him your, your child? And, uh, of course, thanks to the blood of Jesus, his accusations are, are uh, futile. But yet he, he enjoys bringing them anyway. This is his natural habit. We saw it all the way back in the book of Job. He comes trying to accuse, and God says to Satan, Hey, do you know my servant Job? Because Job doesn't, there's nothing, he's not giving Satan anything to accuse him before, before the throne. This is Satan's practice. Now, Jesus said he saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, that's because Satan is, uh, fell from heaven in rebellion against God. That didn't mean that he was barred from ever accessing heaven. It just he meant he lost his position in heaven. He doesn't have a, a place there. But he goes there out of place, apparently, and has gone there for, uh, for the thousand, thousands of years of human history. In this passage, we have Michael the archangel saying, all right, it's time. It's the last three and a half years of human existence, and you, Satan, are done. And he wars against Satan and his angels and pushes them out of heaven. Now, this is something that you might say, well, this just sounds too fantastic. This is all just made up stuff somebody made up. You would think that if you didn't, if you, if all of this weren't predicated by 135 and more throughout the scriptures, fulfilled prophecies that show that this is supernatural, this is of supernatural origin. This is not something that men just made up. So, then here is the war that's described to us in Daniel chapter 12. We have Michael the archangel standing up against the devil and Satan. <clears throat> he, he never, he, he, they are now banned from heaven. They cannot enter heaven. Look at the result of this war. It says in verse 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. When this happens, the devil is aware of what's written in the prophecy. He knows he only has three and a half, half years left. So what is he going to do? He is going to bring the great tribulation on the earth. You see, that is Michael, under the command of God, who causes if you will, in a roundabout way, the great tribulation by kicking the devil out of heaven. The devil no longer can waste his time arguing against the throne, against the blood of Christ, which is a waste of time. Now he must do as much damage to God's people the last few years that he has. He's kicked out and and banned to the earth. And it says, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child and the woman And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. One time, two times, half a time, three and a half years. Verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now we can surmise that this is probably a great army. Uh, Lots of waters usually means lots of different people in, in prophecy, but we don't know. We, we have to understand that we don't know all the answers. But whatever it is that he sends out after uh, the people of Israel, in verse 16, it says, the earth uh, helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. So all we're being told here, according to this vision, is that the dragon is trying to kill and stamp out the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel runs from the land of Israel and hides somewhere in the wilderness. And so the dragon, Satan, then sends armies or something after them, but in some supernatural way that is in the vision pictured by the earth opening up and swallowing the, uh, this, this water, in some supernatural way, God prevents them from stamping out the nation of Israel. And so what does the dragon then do? Well, it says, verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So anywhere I can find a believer, it doesn't have to be a Jewish person, it could be a Gentile person, anyone who keeps the commandments of God, I'm going to kill them. And in chapter 13, we find out how he does it. It's by making everybody worship him, and the ones who won't worship him don't get to receive the mark that proves that they worshipped him. And that's how he can then identify them so he can kill them. All of this is explained to us in Revelation chapter 12 and 13, and it's based on the baseline, the foundation we find in Daniel chapter 12. Because what were the things that we found in Daniel 12? There was a war 
between Michael and the demons, we found that in, in Revelation 12. There was a great persecution against God's people. We saw that in Revelation 12. We saw that there was also a, a deliverance that was brought. But there's one thing missing in Revelation 12. It's the resurrection that he says is going to happen. Right? Daniel chapter 12 says that there's going to be a re resurrection. Well, well, we just have to flip a few pages forward. In, in Revelation chapter 20, it says, after Jesus returns in chap Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1, <clears throat> I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now look at this in verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. What's spelled out for us in Revelation 20 is the two resurrections that Daniel speaks about in Daniel chapter 12. After Jesus returns, those who were not uh, taken in the rapture, who, were, uh, who died during the tribulation, will be resurrected at that time. And there's the end of the resurrection to life. A thousand years later, after Christ has reigned for a thousand years, then the dead will be raised. Those who are on their way to everlasting condemnation, they will be raised to eternal death. So then what we see in Daniel chapter 12, if you'll flip back there with me, is an ex what we see in, in Revelation 12 is an explanation, further understanding of what we find in Daniel 12. All the same things, the resurrection, the, uh, the, the war between Michael and the demons, the, the, the great persecution against God's people, against the nation of Israel, the, the, um, the deliverance that's promised uh, in that persecution all of it's there, but it's not the way we might have expected. We thought Michael was going to be the one coming out and, make, and bringing out the deliverance. Maybe he does. But he's also the one who kicks the devil out, so the whole thing begins. And you have to wonder, if God is sovereign, if God's really in control, how could he let this happen to his people? Well, that's the, what the rest of Daniel chapter 12 addresses. So let's read the next couple of verses if we, if we have the time. I think we have the time. Here we go. Verse 4. Uh, well, verse 3, we haven't read it, so I'll, I'll read that first. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. There we go again. The people of God are the stars, right? That's why in, uh, in Revelation chapter 12 we can easily interpret uh, what that is to mean. Verse 4, uh, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. What is he saying here? He's saying, Daniel, just understand that, that you won't quite understand this just yet. People are going to come and go. They're going to be running to and fro. There's going to be a lot of people that come and go until you get to a place where you can understand this a little better. First of all, there were 135 prophecies that were going to be fulfilled during the Greek Empire that were to prove that this was a true prophecy. And people needed to come and go for the next 300 years before they saw all of those things take place. So they saw the proof of it. And many other things. They, uh, at the time, Daniel had named the Roman Empire. But once Jesus came and, and died and rose from the dead, and then the city of Jerusalem is destroyed under the Roman Empire, then you know, of course, uh, how to interpret these prophecies. So Daniel is here wondering what in the world's going on. And God, God the, the angel, through uh, um, under the command of God, is explaining to Daniel, uh, you, you can't quite get this yet, but people, as they come and go, and knowledge is increased, as people see the events of history, so become more clear. Verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked and beheld, there stood other two. <laughs> now remember, we had three so far. Now, if, if you want to follow, you don't have to. You can keep your finger there in, uh, in chapter 12. But I'm going to read you from chapter 10. Remember, there was first... 
the, the great vision, a vision of Jesus Christ uh, dressed in linen and girt, girt with a golden girdle and standing over the river. Then there was an angel that came to him uh, in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 10. Behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees, and he begins to speak with him. And then there were two other angels that speak with him. It says in, uh, in verse 16, And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men, a different angel comes and speaks to him. And then it says, um, Sons of men, touch my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me. I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there uh, breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man. So as far as we can tell, there's Jesus Christ and three angels. Well now, in chapter 12, verse 5, we see two more. It says in verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two, other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. He's at the river Heidekel. And it says, uh, so now he's seen five angels and Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate glory. He says, I just saw two, the two more that completes the five, one on this side of the river, one on the other. And here's what they say, verse 6, and one said to the man clothed in linen. Who was that? Remember, that was Jesus Christ, clothed in a linen girdle, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Uh, verse 6, these two that are on either side of the river talked to the man in linen, to the pre-incarnate Christ, which was upon the waters of the river. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders, to the end of these terrible, devastating things? How long? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. That's three and a half, right? Time, times, one time, two times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power, power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Here is Jesus Christ himself standing on the river. And when he's asked, how long shall this great trouble come against the people of Israel? He swears and he says, it won't be any longer than exactly three and a half years. Three years and part of another year. It won't be four years. It won't be five years. I promise you, I swear by him that liveth forever and ever, which is himself, I swear by my own self, he's saying, that this will not extend beyond that limited period of time. Now, you can see in this, either you could say, well, listen, uh, how, why would God allow it at all? Or you could say, God's in control of every single day of this persecution, every single day of it. This Holocaust is coming against the Jewish people. Verse 8 says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Like, how, how, what, give me more information, please. Three and a half years, that's all that I know. Verse 9, he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now that's three years and seven months. That's three years and part of another year, a half of another year. Three years and seven months. Now, the word half doesn't mean exactly cut directly in half, right? We understand that. The, the word half just means part of another year. So three and a part. So we have three years and seven months. And then verse 12, it says, But he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Well, that's three years and eight months and eight and fifteen days. Um, it says, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty and five days. But go thy way till the end, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Now this is fascinating, understanding that this is spoken by Jesus Christ himself. Now you might say, well, this is all just nonsense. It's all just, I, we can't possibly figure out what this means or, or what it is. But if Jesus said it, I would say that probably the best way to understand what it means is probably looking at what Jesus said about it. Look with me, if you would, at Matthew chapter 24. We'll close here 
But we'll make a few final concluding remarks from Daniel chapter 12. So if you want to keep your finger there. Remember that it is Christ in his pre-incarnate glory who is speaking this. He says, I'm swearing that there won't be more than three and a half years. And to be very specific with you, Daniel, I want you to understand 1,290 days, that's three years and seven months, that's how long it's going to go. But you're blessed if, if those who are there are blessed if they can make it another 45 days to, this, to the three years and eight and a half month mark. Okay, if you can get there, there, that's the blessing. That's when the blessing comes. But everything else, the, the persecution, if, if you will, that's going to stop at, at the, at the uh, 1290 day mark. Okay, so let's see what Jesus says when he explains his own prophecy. Remember, this is Jesus in his pre-incarnate glory who gave this to Daniel. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to skip a few verses just because um, for sake of time. But the, the context here is the disciples are asking Jesus what it's going to look like right before his, he returns in the end of the world. And first he tells them, listen, there's going to be a lot of earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars, but those things are going to happen all the time. So for, that's not the sign. The sign here he gets, in, he gets to in verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Notice that, that Jesus pauses here as he begins to explain the great tribulation. And he says, you guys need to go read Daniel. If you haven't read Daniel, you, I mean, you're not going to understand this. You guys have to go back and read Daniel. Why? Because it was Christ in his pre-incarnate glory who gave it to Daniel. <laughs> understand this. Jesus is commenting on his own prophecy that he gave to Daniel. He says, remember in Daniel there's, a, there's an abomination of desolation. That's going to be the thing that takes place that you know means you're real close to the end. Because remember, it was three and a half years after that. Verse 16, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Well, that's exactly what we read in Revelation chapter 12. Israel ran to the wilderness. And we're protected there. Verse 17, let him which is on the housetop that not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. He goes on and on. But then he says in verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation. There's the phrase that we use as the title of this sermon. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. That's exactly what Daniel said in chapter, one, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. He said, then shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time. Jesus explains this and rephrases it this way. Then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. Nor, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved. Uh, Jesus is commenting on his own days that he gave to Daniel. Remember, Jesus, in his pre-incarnate glory, told Daniel it was going to be 1,290 days and then 1,335 days. He's like, okay, I'm just three years and seven months, but then there's another month and a half after that. And the point that Jesus is saying is that I was making a point there in Daniel chapter 12. I'm saying that even though it's three years and eight and a half months from the abomination of desolation until I return, I'm going to cut it all short at three years and seven months, a month and a half early. I'm going to cut it all short a little early because if I didn't cut it all short a little early, then no flesh would be saved. That's how bad this persecution will be that all of Israel will just be stamped out of existence and all of the believers in God will be stamped out of existence if Christ doesn't step in and prevent it and stop this persecution 50, uh, 45 days before his return. Now, he's still going to return on time, but he does something. We read about that in the book of Revelation. It's called the vile judgments or the bold judgments, but, but that's beside the point. The point is that Jesus is quoting Daniel chapter 12 as he's explaining this. What we're seeing here, we can go on and on and see how Jesus constantly in, in Matthew 24 quotes passages from the book of Daniel. It's the entire context of Daniel, uh, Matthew 24. And those who attempt to try to say they know what Matthew 24 means but have never done a study of Daniel are completely and utterly lost. And I feel so bad for them because 
Jesus says to us, we, can't un- we cannot understand that prophecy without understanding Daniel. Daniel is the foundation point. But what I want us to grab from this for, for, for our study today is clearly Christ is in control of all of this. He's, he's in control of the whole thing. As a matter of fact, you can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And when, when Moses is about to die, before he dies, he writes an, a song to the people of Israel. And he says to them, listen, you, I'm going to write you a song about the goodness of God because there's going to come a day in the latter days when you guys have turned away from God and uh, God's going to bring great trouble upon the people. And when that happens, I want you to sing this song to remember that God will deliver you if you just turn back to him. All the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 31. It's found in in Jeremiah chapter 30. We see, oh, there's going to be a time of of Jacob's trouble that's going to really just be this terrible time of trouble against the people of Israel. God's known this from the beginning of time. Since before there was a nation, he already knew that this great tribulation was going to come on the people of Israel and on all believers during that time. And you have to ask, scratch your head and say, "Well, well, then why hasn't he stopped it? In fact, it seems like the things that God tells Michael to do actually sets the dominoes in, in, in order. It starts, tips over the first domino that leads to this. What is going on here? Well, it's all leading up to the great glory of God that is coming at his return. If you'll read the book of Revelation, it will explain to you what's going on. The whole thing is one giant opportunity for those who are, who are being persecuted to stay faithful to Christ and glorify his name because they have a resurrection waiting for them. This life is not about our comfort, our happiness, our enjoyment. This life is not for that. The next life, sure, we're going to be very comfortable, very happy, very, very filled with enjoyment, okay? That's happening in the next life for those who are believers. This life is for the glory of God. Understand that when God brings trouble and suffering and tribulation, when he brings the great tribulation, he has a great purpose. And I think that we can very easily surmise that if God is sovereign in the great tribulation, if he's still in charge during the great tribulation, surely he is still in charge and he's still sovereign in the small tribulations. I mean... Don't we all go through tribulation? Uh, The book of Thessalonians tells us we're appointed to tribulation. That's like part of being a Christian, is people start hating you because you believe the word of God. It's just part of it, you know? If God is sovereign and he's in control of the great tribulation, he's sovereign and he's in control of the small tribulations. If God has a purpose in the great tribulation, God has a purpose in the small tribulations. If God... If God can bring about his glory in the great tribulation, he can bring about his glory in the small tribulations. In fact, I would say it's not just that he can, it's a guarantee that he will. God is not uh, not pleased with the suffering of his people just because they're suffering. As a matter of fact, you read the book of Revelation, you can tell that he's very angry with the Antichrist and those who are causing his people to suffer, those who are putting his people to death, those who are making war with the saints. He's very angry about that. He's not happy about that at all. But they have an opportunity to, to, to honor and glorify God by their suffering to bring many to righteousness. Here's the comment I told you I would bring from uh, Daniel chapter 12 before we close. Look at verse 3 again. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This reminds me of of 2 Peter that says, where is the promise of his coming? You know, he's... It's like, like ever since the beginning of the world, everything's just kind of continued on like it was. And, and I thought Jesus was coming back. And Peter reminds his readers that the Lord is not slack. He's not lazy concerning his promise, as some men count laziness or slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not 
willing that any should perish. Do you know that even in the three and a half years right before Jesus returns, he's still not willing that any should perish? He's giving one last massive opportunity where the entire world will be focused on God's people. All of them will be focused on either trying to kill them or wondering at their amazing faith being willing to die for this, for this Christ. And many will be turned to righteousness during that time. Many will choose not to take the mark of the beast simply because these persecuted believers are persecuted more than anyone has ever been persecuted before. It will bring to people's attention the glory of God. They must serve a magnificent God to be willing to be persecuted and go to death for him. They must really know that there really is a resurrection coming for them in the future. There must be something significantly different about them. And many are turned to righteousness during this time. If God can use the great tribulation, God can use the small tribulations. In fact, he does. He's not out allowing tribulations and troubles in our lives because he just likes to see us suffer. When tribulations and trials and troubles and difficulties come into our lives, we can be confident. We may never see how this thing glorifies God in this life, but we can be confident that God has a glorious purpose. He does. He always does. If he has one in the great tribulation, he certainly has one in all the small tribulations. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, as I come to you this morning, having been completely overwhelmed by this glorious book, I am reminded of my inability to serve you without your help. And I'm reminded of your help. Now it often comes in the form of troubles and difficulties. Lord, that you would help me to have a life of purpose by giving me suffering is, uh, well, it's quite spectacular. That I can be confident that when I go through troubles and difficulties, that you're using it for your glorious purpose. I thank you for that. I think of those who cannot have the assurance of Daniel in the very last verse of this passage. For those today who may be sitting here and uh, wouldn't be able to have what, what, God's, what you said to Daniel, where you said to him, you will stand in your lot at the end of the days. If there's anyone here today, Lord, that, uh, that does not have that confidence in you, they know that they're saved and on their way to eternal joy and life with you. I pray that today you would convict them by, by your spirit in their hearts of their need for salvation. But for those of us who can say with Daniel, we know we get to stand in our lot at the end of the days, I pray that you'd help us, Lord to endure whatever persecution and tribulation you've given us. And we thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege that it is to endure it. We pray these things in Jesus' name.